to talk a little bit about what we're talking about in that song he gave his life for me. So Romans 5, I had wanted to cover verses 5 through 8, but I think for time's sake we're just going to cover 5 and 6 today. So Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, And hope make it not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. If you recall previously, we looked at tribulations and patience and experience and hope. And we'll raise up some thoughts on hope today. Oh, brother mentioned, or brother Larry alluded to this in his announcements. How we we don't live in a very patient world today. I'll um, say that in two ways. People are just always in a rush. Mm -hmm. People don't like to wait on things. And that's why we buy everything on credit nowadays. But also, if you recall from our lesson last week, patience also means to endure, and most people don't like to endure today. Most people want to give up when the going gets rough. Whether that's, that's it. Whether that's uh, in serving God, or whether that's in marriage, or jobs, or whatever it may be. We, we live in a country that likes to throw things away and start over. Mm -hmm. But patience is an attribute of the child of God. And we see the end result of patience is hope in verse 5. Hope maketh not ashamed, he says. We looked at this a little bit last week as well. But hope that comes from God doesn't cause us to be disappointed. Hope that is built upon our faith in God will not leave us ashamed or embarrassed. Amen. Well, this, we build up our hope through our experiences, as it says here, you know, experience, work with hope. And through that hope, we can be unashamed of the hope that lies within us. Through that, we can stand boldly on God and His Word. Amen. I think some that are, have been in the faith longer than I can testify though, that their their hope has grown stronger as they longer they serve God. And we become less and less, let's say, ashamed or embarrassed by these things. Well, I know as a young Christian I was could be a little bit embarrassed sometimes to speak of the Lord, but right. It doesn't help that I was a shy person naturally anyway, but Say sometimes that comes out again, but I'm much more ready and willing to tell others of Christ today than I was you know, almost 20 years ago. Amen. But he gives us the reason why Pope makes not ashamed in the last part of that verse. He says, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. This love of God, he said, is shed abroad in our hearts. That was this God's love towards us has been bestowed abundantly, you could say, in our hearts. As we continue to serve God throughout the years, and as we go through these tribulations, as our faith grows, we will see God's inexhaustible love towards us more and more. Amen. Well, certainly we understand God's love is a greater than our carnal understanding, but I think the longer you go and the more you study God's Word, the more you see His faithfulness, the more you will see that His love abounds greater than we can imagine. Amen. Well, now, there are some people who have reduced God's love down to a, just tolerance, or they reduce His to almost a, a lustly type of love. Mm -hmm. God doesn't literally come down and give us hugs and kisses and tell us He loves us, but there is such theology that teaches that, though. Right. Back to, <coughs> I can't, I don't know the name of the song, but there's a supposedly Christian song that compares it to a sloppy wet kiss. Oh, Lord. How foolish is that? Amen. But no, he shows us his love toward us in many ways, but ultimately it's, he shows us his love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. God shows his love toward us and that he chastises us and corrects us. He shows his love towards us and his faithfulness towards us. He, we see his love displayed 
here, as we'll see, by Christ and what he has done for us. Now, he says here that the love of God is shed in our, abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. I want to take a side note for a minute, talk about the Holy Ghost. So that's, the Holy Ghost has numerous names in the scriptures. Uh, we call him sometimes the third part of the Godhead. But he is just as much equal and co-eternal as the Father and the Son. Amen. But he goes by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord. Sometimes just simply the Spirit or my Spirit of God speaking. Amen. Uh, I did some research and uh, he's called the Holy Spirit seven times, the Holy Ghost 89 times, all of the New Testament. Spirit of God 27 times, which is the first name we're given in Genesis 1-2. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of the Lord 31 times and when he's called the Spirit or my Spirit, it's at least 107 times. Amen. We not we shouldn't ignore the, the Spirit of the Lord. We should not just brush him off as not an important part of God. But he is the one who takes the word of God in our hearts and makes it effectual. Amen. He's the one that Christ said would lead us in all truth. Amen. So it's the Holy Spirit which brings the love of God into our hearts and causes us to see it and understand it. You know, if you try to understand the love of God through the carnal mind, you you'll end up with all sorts of misunderstandings. That's how you end up with the, the sloppy wet kiss theology. Right. That's how you end up thinking, well, bad things should never happen to me because God loves me. But no, God doesn't just spare us from bad things because he loves us. Well, that's a whole other rabbit trail we can get down where we want today, but without the Holy Spirit, we can't have a proper understanding of the love of God. You're right. I think that's why there's so much I don't like to use this term, but it's one popular day, misinformation about God and his love in the world today. There's so much false teaching and because man tries to understand God through the carnal mind. He tries to understand the love of God through what he thinks about as love. But God through the Holy Spirit shows us the love of God. Mm -hmm. That really it says many ways, but it culminates in that Christ died for us. He says in the next part of there, the shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And be sure that the indwelling of the Spirit is a gift of God. I mean, it doesn't, we didn't just wake up one day and say, Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Right. Or God sends it as he pleases. In the Old Testament, we see that the Spirit of God could come unto people and leave people as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Psalms 51 11, David prayed when he was confessing the sin of Bathsheba. He said, And take not the Holy Spirit from me. And in 1 Samuel 16 14, it tells us that the Spirit of the Lord left Saul, and the evil spirit came upon him. Right. And Ezekiel mentions multiple times how the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Entered him, that's actually what it says. But we see for us it's different today. We are given the Holy Spirit that He might dwell with us forever. John 14 26, can't quite quote that, so I'll turn over and read it for us. John 14 26. is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Amen. So we, we see here that the Holy Spirit comes from God, the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, as we call here. He's sent by God and he teaches us in all things. You know, we can have a mental understanding of the Word of God, but it's really the Holy Spirit which makes it effectual in our lives. Amen. Well, Acts 2 was when he sent the Holy Spirit upon the first church there in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. If you recall, the Holy Spirit came down as a, as a mighty rushing wind. He bad. And if you 
turn over to, or look back farther in chapter 14 there, John verses 16 and 17, he says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seems him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he and shall be in you. This is the position of the Holy Spirit for the believer. He is in us, and he's with us, and he teaches us all things. And Amen. He says that he will be with you forever. That doesn't mean for a little while and he'll go away, but for us as New Testament believers, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us forever. He says, Amen. That doesn't mean that we can't grieve him or quench him. That's very, really, very evident by the scriptures. First Thessalonians 5, 19 tells us to quench not the Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 tells us that we can grieve the Spirit. We might not always feel His presence, but He will not leave us as we just saw in the Scripture. Having the Spirit is a mark of the child of God. Romans 8.9 tells us that if we don't have the Spirit of God, then you are not Christ. You're not of Christ. The Holy Spirit is essential to salvation. He's essential to being a child of God. He's essential to our understanding of the Word of God. He's a the essential to all aspects of our service for God. Amen. And in Ephesians 1, verse 12 through 14 tells us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Also tells us there that He is the earnest of our inheritance. That is, mm -hmm. He is what we might call a deposit today. That God has given us the Holy Spirit to tell us that He has come back to give us the rest. Amen. The indwelling of the Spirit is just a, a taste of what awaits us as the children of God. And yet sometimes I don't think we think very often on that either, do we? we go, yeah, we know about the Holy Spirit, we know about the Holy Ghost, and we don't be careful to be too much like the Pentecostals, and <laughs> it wouldn't hurt us to be a little more lively, I think, though. But, right. But we don't mean to mistake the Holy Spirit for emotionalism either. Yeah. Or just the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, whichever you would like to call Him, that shows us God's love and makes it effectual in our heart. Is Him which teaches us things in the Word of God effectually. It's by Him which we really truly serve God. But we need to be remember to, to give attention to the Holy Ghost as well, not just. Put them on the back burner, if you will. Amen. Well, the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us, and then says because of this, because we have the love of God in our hearts, and we have the, the Holy Ghost making it effectual, if you will. And, mm -hmm. and so we have no reason to be ashamed of the hope that lies within us. You're right. I'm going to go on to verse 6. Well, verse 6 through 8, we're all expounding upon this love of God. So we'll just look at verse 6 today. It says, For when we were yet without strength. So he is talking to saved folks here. Though. But there is, in a sense, hope for the unbeliever as well. Because it tells what Christ has done for us and what Christ can do for you. Yeah. You know, not saved. He said we were without strength. As we had no strength to save ourselves. We were... It wasn't that the natural man was just sick and needed a band-aid to cover up his wound, but we were completely bedridden, if you will. That's it. We were completely helpless because he said that we were without strength. We were, I mean, that means we had no strength. There was nothing that we could do in our own power to save ourselves. So the natural man has no spiritual life, Ephesians 2, 1 tells us that we were dead in trespassing the sins. Matthew 26, 41 describes the flesh as being weak. Mm -hmm. The natural man, the flesh, it cannot, doesn't have any spiritual strength of its own. It doesn't, you don't need to just turn over a new leaf and live a good life and, and God will save you. Right. That's quite contrary to what our text here says. That God saves the ungodly. No, the natural man was in and of himself hopeless without Christ. Right. Outside of Christ, without His dying for us, we would be 
still without strength today. Mm -hmm. That was the problem with the Pharisees and those type of religions that they were going about in their own strength, trying to please God, to win God's favor. Mm -hmm. They thought they were doing God some sort of service by their, quote, righteousness. Right. So what Paul kind of realized and all of them needed to see is that in their own strength, they could not save themselves. That's a. You know, he said he counted all those things but dumb that he might win Christ. But all those things that he could boast about in the flesh that were worthless. I mean, he was a, a Pharisee, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and of the stock of the tribe of Benjamin. He had much to boast about in a self righteous way, but yet none of those things will do us any good when it comes to salvation. Amen. He says, "Without when we were yet without strength and due time, that is, in the time that God appointed, in the process of time, if you will, that God works on His own time, and He brought to pass the death of Christ exactly when He had planned for it to happen. Mm -hmm. well, Christ was not Plan B or C or whatever. Right. But really, all the way in eternity past, it's, it says of Christ that He was a Lamb slain." Before the foundation of the world, you're right. That God declared that from ancient times the things which are not, the things which have not happened, yet though they shall be, and He shall. God already pre purposed and foreordained, if you will, that when Christ would come, when Christ would die, how would He would die? You're right. He was delivered by the foreknowledge of God, Acts tells us. So it was in, in due time, in the right time that God appointed, and Christ would come and Christ would die. Jesus said here, Christ died for the ungodly. That should be an only thought for the child of God that we were at one time ungodly and wicked. And right. We did not honor God, we did not revere God, and yet Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. And for those that are not saved, that should be a, a ray of hope, if you will, that God saves the ungodly. But you don't have to become a good person to be saved. That you don't have to do no good works. But God will save an individual in their ungodly state. Right. And there are some that teach that you have to do certain things, and then God will accept you. But you have to do all these good works, and the hope when you stand before God that your good works will outweigh your bad works. Or... But no, the Scripture is very clear here that Christ died for the ungodly, and He didn't die for. The righteous. He didn't die for those who were trusting in their own works. He didn't die for good men, but yet he died for the ungodly. And until we see ourselves that way, we will never be willing to see Christ as Savior. Amen. And that is the problem with many modern churches today that they, they see themselves as a good person, they see themselves as a Having enough good works, or well, I go to church, so that's going to be enough. Or, you know, I believe in God, so that's sufficient. So Christ saves the ungodly. Amen. The fact that, that Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, that He would even die for the ungodly should be a very humbling thought. Mm -hmm. That He. He was the sinless Lamb of God. He was without sin. There was no guile found in his mouth, the scriptures say of him. And yet, as we saw in chapter 4, he took upon our sin and gave us his righteousness. But we no longer, if we are saved, we no longer are in the state of ungodliness. Amen. But that doesn't give us a right to say, well, look at me, look what I am doing, look what I have done. Rather, it's even more a reason that we should say, look at what Christ has done for me. But to remain in the state of ungodliness would mean that we would remain under the full wrath and judgment of God. Right. Second Peter describes that. Second Peter 4, verses 6 through 7, talk about the angels that sinned, how God cast them in outer darkness. It talks about the whole world that was destroyed by the flood, he destroyed those ungodly men. And Sodom and Gomorrah, how he 
destroyed them in their wickedness. Chapter 3, verse 7 just tells us that the heavens now and the world now that are preserved by the word of God unto the day of judgment of ungodly men. Amen. Jude, in verses 14 and 15, describe with the prophecy of Enoch how that Christ would come back, as it says, ten thousands of angels to execute judgment upon the ungodly. And yet Christ died for us and we were ungodly. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't deserve to be delivered from sin. We didn't deserve for Christ to die for us, but what we deserved was that full judgment of God upon us. Amen. And that's what exactly where all those who do not have faith in Christ, who are never born again, that's exactly where they will stand is in the full judgment of God. Amen. You have, you have to be very thankful that Christ died for the ungodly. We'll look at a little bit this next week. Lord willing, our next lesson, the verses 7 and 8 describe how the Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Amen. And this is a chief saying that Christ came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. But these verses here are the humblest as the people of God. We're not as good as sometimes we think we are. Right. We were certainly not good at all before we were saved. You know, I look back and I was saved as a young child, 12 years old, almost 13. And most people would describe me as a good kid. I didn't get in much trouble. I got good grades in school. I did all those things, but yet, in the sight of God, I was still ungodly and sinful in need of a Savior. Right. And it wasn't until April the 7th, 2004, that the Holy Spirit revealed that to me and showed me I needed a Savior. Amen. Until you see yourself as ungodly, like I said, you will not see your need for Christ. But oh, for us that are saved, that we got to thank God that Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. That Christ died for us is really the heart of the gospel. We'll go ahead and close with that thought. Amen.